Well, a very good morning to you all. Lovely to see you. We'll, we'll start our time in prayer and then we'll take a look at Genesis chapter 26 together. Let's pray. Father, we've just uh, sung about your word uh, and just what a wonder it is. Uh, we pray, Lord, that you would help us to hunger after what it is that you have to say to us. Uh, and that as we do look into your word this morning, we will see more of, of you. Uh, that we will see more of the Lord Jesus Christ in all of his glory and all of his beauty. Father, teach us, move us. We pray, Lord, that these won't just be words that we, uh, that we hear and then forget, but words that will remain in our hearts, changing the way that we, we think and the way that we act. So be with us this morning and be with our children too. We ask this in your name. Amen. Okay, well, do you have uh, Genesis 20, 26 open in front of you? Uh, it's a very interesting passage. It's probably not one, you know, if you were randomly just, just preaching uh, in, a, in a random church somewhere and they said, you can choose what you want to preach on, you probably wouldn't pick a passage like this. Uh, I don't know what you made of it when it was being read. It's, uh, but, but I hope that we're going to be really blessed by looking at what's in it this morning. Now, depending who you ask, there are currently as many as 56 wars or conflicts between nations currently going on. And that is, apparently, the highest number since the Second World War. Can you imagine that? I mean, let that sink in just for a moment. That's the direction of travel in our world, isn't it? Despite advances in just about every field of study and, and you know, improving life in so many different ways... We still struggle to get on with our neighbours. It's what the human heart's like, isn't it? Because even in our personal lives, this is true, isn't it? You, you can't get through life without conflict. It's all around us. There will always be people that you clash with, that you don't see eye to eye with, or, or people who clash with you, <laughs> at the very least, and for a variety of reasons, and some of which might be well beyond your control, and it seems terribly unfair, doesn't it? So most people realise that, that knowing or, or learning in life how to deal with conflict, that's actually a really important life skill, isn't it? It's even perhaps a survival skill in, in some cases. So much so that if you do a quick Google, which is what I did this week, and Googled just, you know, I, I think I Googled the term Guide to conflict, conflict Resolution. Now, you can't see the results, probably, or whatever on the screen. But it immediately brings up on the first page a three-step, a four-step, a five-step, a seven-step, and an eight-step guide to managing conflicts. Everyone's got something to say on this. For some reason, I don't know why it is, there is no six-step plan. So if you want to come up with one, uh, that, that, that'd, be, that'd be good for us all, I think. There's room for you on Google. Now, skimming through some of those guides, which I did do, just to see what they've got to say, see what wisdom they might uh, impart, they do, on the whole, here's the thing, they seem to assume that the person you're having a conflict with is, A, rational, <laughs> and that, B, they are actually themselves seeking a peaceable solution to what's going on. But you're laughing because you know, don't you? That is not always the case. Sometimes these things are just out of control. Uh, and, and, and what do you do when your enemy simply doesn't like you or despises you for something you can't control? The colour of your skin, the way you speak, the beliefs that you hold to. I mean, that's the world we live in, isn't it? Full of that sort of stuff. Or maybe, as in the, the case here with, with Isaac, if, you, if, you, if you're with us in Genesis 26 here, simply because of envy, but simply because they are jealous of what you have. You've done them no wrong. They're just jealous of you. Uh, take a look and, and let's remind ourselves of where we, where we left off with Isaac last time. Just, just glance down at, at before the passage we read. Verses 30, verse 13, talking about Isaac, it says, The man became rich and his wealth continued to grow until he became very wealthy. This is because God is blessing him. He had so many flocks and herds and servants that the Philistines envied him. So all the wells that his father's servants had dug in the time of his father Abraham, the Philistines stopped them up, 
filling them with earth. I mean, it does sound like, you know, what they, what they say, you know, cutting off your nose to spite your face. Why would you, in the middle of a famine, probably a drought, why would you backfill a well? Who does that? And yet that's how much they despise this foreigner amongst them. Now, the setting here is that Isaac has obeyed the Lord. You remember? He stayed in the land, as God said to him, you stay here, I'll bless you. And despite a severe famine that's afflicting it, Isaac's gone and planted crops, and they've grown. A hundredfold he's, he's reaped in the middle of a famine. That's incredible. He's succeeding. He's being blessed by God. Whilst everyone around him, picture it, they're all struggling. Yeah, they're struggling to make ends meet. And you can imagine the muttering amongst the resident Philistines, can't you? I mean, it, it's, such, you know, it's such a human thing, isn't it? Uh, here's this foreigner. This, actually, he's a traveler lodging amongst us. He's never even actually become one of us. Uh, he's an outsider, and he's reaping the best of our land. That's what he's doing. He's getting the best out of it. And they can't pin anything on him, because, you know, who controls the crops? I mean, they've all got as much of a chance, haven't they, in, in their worldview? How is he succeeding in a time of economic decline? Something's fishy. Something, something must not be quite right here. He needs taking down. And so they backfill the wells that his flocks and his herds need to survive. And, and uh, what's more, Abimelech himself. So Abimelech, he's the king of the Philistines, right? We've actually met him before back in, uh, was it chapter 22? Abimelech comes to him and he basically banishes him. Look at verse 16. He banishes him. You know, you're, you're too big. You're too dominant. You must leave. I mean, it's not a suggestion, isn't it? it it's, it's leave. He's told, up sticks, go, leave everything familiar to you. And, and so Isaac moves away. He moves apparently further down this valley, the valley of Gerar. He's moving away from the Philistines. And that's, that's where we left off last time, right? Now, Genesis chapter 26, it really is the chapter in Genesis that tells the bulk of the Isaac story. His story's quite short, only one chapter, really. It, it tells us, um, th this story, that he is following in the footsteps of his father Abraham. Do you remember we looked at that? Both for the good and for the bad, he's, he's repeating a lot of what he saw in his father. And even in this short narrative then, just one chapter, we do get a sense, don't we, of Isaac's growing, progressing faith. And that's encouraging in itself, isn't it? it it's not that when we put our trust in the Lord Jesus that just somehow... We're zapped and we're perfect and we've got it all nailed down and we no longer make any mistakes. No, 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 couldn't be further from the truth. What you're seeing here is his growing trust in Yahweh, the God of his Father. The same is true of us. The, the Lord works in us through trials and difficulties and everything he puts in our lives to, to bring to completion the work he started in us, right? And so this second half of the chapter tells us how this man of faith, Isaac, how he's growing, and, and actually uh, how he handles conflict in the light of his faith. And, uh, and listen, here's something. You won't find his approach to handling conflict in any of those Google guides. You won't. There's, some, gonna be, there's something here that all of them have, have missed. Right? So here we are. Essentially, we have three scenes in the passage we just read, and I got them all to start with T, so it's good for your notes, right? First of all, we have trouble in verses 18 to 22. The situation with the Philistines just gets from, goes from bad to worse. Trouble. And then thanksgiving in 23 to 25. Isaac builds an altar to praise his God for the provision and the protection that he has given to him. And then finally, treaty in verses 26 to 33. Isaac makes an agreement with Abimelech himself. So let's read on and look at, and look at the first verse. You've got, got the scene, let's, let's get into it. Verse 18. Isaac reopened the wells that had been dug in the time of his father Abraham, which the Philistines had stopped up after Abraham died, and he gave them the same names his father had given them. Isaac's servants dug in the valley and discovered a well of fresh water there, but the herdsmen of Gerar quarreled with Isaac's herdsmen and said, the water's ours. So he named the well Essek because they disputed with him. Then they dug another well and they quarreled over that one also. So he named it Sitna. He moved on from there and dug another well. 
and no one quarreled over it. So he named it Rehoboth, saying, now the Lord has given us room and we will flourish in the land. You got the scene there? You've seen the little process of what's going on here at the beginning? Now, on reflection, I think verse 18 there, how this starts out, is a sort of a recap. I, I think what it's actually saying is there, there is Isaac had reopened the wells which Abraham, his father, had first dug and which the Philistines, in their spite against this family, uh, then refilled again. Uh, it's an unwinnable situation. Can you feel it? It is unwinnable, isn't it? It's like Isaac's on the retreat down the valley all the way, hounded by these people. Uh, so he's moving down there. And, and the author draws our attention to the fact that as Isaac reopened these wells, look at the detail here, he gives them their original names. Why does he do that? Well, it's a reminder of who originally dug them. Yeah, historical little reminder here. Just, you know, your locals all knew, knew these. They know these names. I'm just giving them back their original names. This, is, this was the work of our hands. But now they must dig again, and, and this time away from Gerar, this settlement of the Philistines, and they're moving down the valley. And, and sure enough, verse 19, they do find fresh water. But the Philistines are upon them. <laughs> as soon as they get the water, there's a quarrel. They're claiming the water is theirs. I don't know why they would think that. It's come from under the ground, but there we are. This is our well. Get away. And then again, perhaps a bit, you can, you can picture it, can't you? Moving down this valley, dig again a bit further away. Maybe we're okay here. And again, a, a, a quarrel happens. Same thing. And so Isaac backs down these two times. But on their third attempt, now right down the valley, they're now far enough away from the men of Gerar that they don't, they don't want to take it from him. And the names of these wells, funny names, aren't they? They spell out Isaac's trials here, right? So Essek, the first well, means quarrel or contention. Sitna, the second well, means hostility. That's what his life is like. I don't know how long it takes to dig a well. I imagine it takes a while. They're settled for a while in each of these places, being moved on and moved on. And they're finally at last Rehoboth, which means open space. Isaac exclaims there, doesn't he, in that last verse that we read, the Lord has given us room and we will flourish in the land. Yeah, God has kept his word to flourish, to bless us, to prosper us. Okay, so what's the point of all of this? This you know, chase down the valley, as it were. Very slow motion chase, isn't it? Well, I take it this story is here is to teach us something about Isaac's faith. Uh, and, you know, all of these stories do, don't they? And specifically, how it affects the way that he handles conflict. And I hope that's instructive to us as well. So pushed about and taken advantage of, what are Isaac's options? What are his options here, this, this man? Well, for starters, he could have pushed back. And that's not being unrealistic. By his own admission, did he catch it? Abimelech, in verse 16, has recognized Isaac is too powerful for them already. I mean, this is not just a small concern here, Isaac. It's the reason that Abimelech wants him out of there in the first place. They're a threat. And in one sense, then the Philistines are playing a risky game here, aren't they? They're, they're as it were, poking the bear. Because, you know, if, if Isaac turns, it could be difficult. And perhaps it's actually because they know Isaac's character, they know the way he responds to these things, that they, they get, become so brazen, so, so bold in doing this to him. He does seem, doesn't he, to have a roll over and show your belly kind of attitude to dealing with conflict here. What's going on? So Isaac comes across, I think, just as Abraham did, actually, as, as a man pursuing peace. He's striving for peace. He wants good relationship with his neighbors. That's a good model to us. The only time, you remember, that, that, that Abraham took up arms was in defense of someone else. The only time he ever raises an army, do you remember? He goes out in, verse, in, in chapter 14 to go and rescue Lot. See, I don't think this is cowardice on Isaac's part. I think it's faith. And I think that's the missing element in conflict resolution, isn't it? It's faith. Because I think we are naturally inclined to, 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 to try and give as good as we get generally in life. It's the first instinct, isn't it, in this life? When we are offended, 
our fir the first thing that happens in us is we get riled up about it, don't we? It makes, it's upsetting. We get angry. Now, I'm, sure, I'm sure we've said this before, but it is, it's so characteristic of, of humanity, isn't it? If you observe how this happens in the real world, it never comes out even, does it, like that? So it's, it's Johnny pinches his brother Jimmy, and we don't know why he did it. It was just a spur-of-the-moment thing. But Jimmy pinches back, <coughs> and much harder. I mean, he gives it a twist, doesn't he? Because he's annoyed. Now, Johnny must retaliate back by giving his brother a dead arm. I mean, he's going to pound him, right? Jimmy returns the compliment by kicking his brother in the shins. It's just the way it goes, isn't it? And before you know, all-out war has, assumed, uh, as, 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 has uh, ensued in the back of the car, hasn't it? All of this stuff is going on. Now, that's kids, but scale that up to nations and states rather than children. You've got something like what's going on in the Middle East, haven't you? I'll lob this over the wall, and then we'll lob that back over the wall, and it's bigger, and it'll do more. But this is not the way that those who live by faith act, individual or nation. The Apostle Paul spells out how we are to treat those who treat us as enemies. He says in Romans 12, listen to what he says. He, he lays it out here. It's like a guideline. He says, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what's right in the eyes of everybody. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it's written, it's mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. That's like a handbook for how to resolve conflict, isn't it? How to handle enemies. This is how we should live. Now listen, lest you think it is, this is, this is not to be a doormat. No, this is to trust God. It is to recognize that if we try to get even, inevitably what happens is we escalate the conflict. Why? Because vengeance belongs to God, not to us. It should be he who repays, not us. Because he is just. He's just. He knows what's been done to you. He sees the hurt caused. He's not blind to these things. And there will be a reckoning. If not in this life, <clears throat> then it will be at the final judgment. That's the story the Bible gives us. Do you see why that makes such a big difference? Because if that's true, if we really believe that, brothers and sisters, then all feelings of anger and all desires for revenge, they can actually evaporate from our hearts and instead, they can be replaced by acts of love. I don't need to get revenge. I don't need to get my own back. They will face the judge. And by the way, do you see how the, the reality of a final day of judgment changes everything? <clears throat> it actually means that no one gets away with anything in this life. Everyone will give account for every action and word and thought. And on that day, on that final day of judgment, there will be nowhere to hide, nowhere to run. On that day, your only hope will be found in putting your trust in Jesus, in trusting him to be your defender. It will only be found in, in him, the judge, already having borne the penalty for your sins on the cross. You don't want that final day to arrive unless you've taken shelter in him. Isaac rests in God, doesn't he? That's what he's doing. He, he says, I rest in God, my shield and my defender. That's who God is to Isaac. He knows that God has promised to bless him and to prosper him and to take care of him. And if God, if the Lord, if Yahweh, that this mighty God is with him, then no Philistine mob, not even their army, can stand against him nor thwart God's plans for him. And that is why his heart then swells with praise 
and thanksgiving. That's what we see in this next section. Have a look. Let's read on verse 23. From there, he went up to Beersheba. It's pretty close. He's almost there by now. He's at the end of the, of the valley. That night, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am the God of your father, Abraham. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. I will bless you and will increase the number of your descendants for the sake of my servant, Abraham. Isaac built an altar there and called on the name of the Lord. And there he pitched his tent and there his servants dug a well. And I think we're supposed to see here, it is again this repetition of the great covenant made with Abraham. Isaac now steps up. He's taking his father's place as patriarch here, the custodian of the covenant made all those years ago when, when, when the Lord called Abraham to be his, to follow him. And what a word of encouragement he receives. God comes to us with encouragement. Isn't that wonderful? In these difficult times, in these times of trouble, I am with you. I will bless you. I will increase you. Don't be afraid, Isaac. There's nothing encourages God's people like receiving God's word. I'm convinced of that. Haven't you found that to be true? When you know that God is speaking to you, I speak to, I speak to many of you after, after services here in this church, and I can see the thrill on your faces when you tell me that God has said something to you through his word that's really spoken to you. It's thrilling, isn't it? But can I just ask, can I challenge you? Did you thank him for it? What a good thing for God to do. God loves to, to condescend, to, to, to bend down and accommodate himself to us and to bring a word of encouragement to his children so that they might be fortified and strengthened in their walk of faith. We need to minister that to each other, don't shouldn't we? As brothers and sisters. Now there's something really quite striking here that I don't want you to miss. And, and it would perhaps be more so if you were one of, a, of Isaac's pagan neighbours here in this incident. Okay? You see, for the Canaanites and for the Philistines, for these pagans around him, you built altars and you built shrines and you built temples so that you could bring offerings to your God in order to secure the blessing, right? That's the way around it works. You, you put the money in, you get the goods out. That's pagan religion in, in Canaan, isn't it? Uh, you want crops to, to give a good yield like, like Isaac's have? Well, first of all, you placate the gods, you bring all manner of offerings and sacrifices. I mean, if you're really serious, you bring, a child, you bring your child. Give them to your God. Trying to win the God over desperately. Trying to win this God over to your side. It's evil. But not, 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 I, not Isaac, not Abraham. Not those who worship Yahweh. No, they build their altars. Notice this. They build their altars in response to the goodness and to the blessings that God has already bestowed on them. Isn't that wonderful? So different. They build their altars because they know that their God has already graciously promised the blessing. And they build their, altar, their altars then out as, a, as an overflow, an outflow of thanksgiving that God is so good to them. Yes, Isaac, you have no need to defend yourself. You have no need to fight for a bigger share of the good things in life. Why? Because every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, as James reminds us. And he is the God who does not change like shifting shadows. He's constant. He's reliable. We do not need to win God's favor somehow. Jesus has done that. He's done that on your and my behalf. Do you realize that? It's his perfect life of obedience, his spotless sacrifice on our behalf that gives us the privilege of being able to approach God in all of his holiness and to, and to, and to make our requests to him with thanksgiving. And you should do that. We should do that. Because like a good and perfect father, he never begrudges his children bringing him their, their, their needs, coming to him with every need. He doesn't get fed up with it or tired with it or ratty or bad-tempered. No, he loves it. And he never changes. He loves to give good gifts. 
Now, if this is true, A, it should mean we're on our knees a lot more, shouldn't it? But B, it means we should be so thankful. Thankfulness should be constantly on our lips, and I wonder if it is, every day. Not only, though, is our Father the source of all good gifts, he's also the ruler of hearts. He's the ruler of hearts. Uh, and we see this in our third scene as we, as we finish up here. As Isaac's enemies now come and seek a treaty with him. <clears throat> Take a look with me at verse 26. Meanwhile, Abimelech had come to him from Gerar, and Ahuzath, his personal advisor, and Phicol, the commander of his forces. Isaac asked them, Why have you come to me since you were hostile and sent me away? Now, first... Notice Abimelech, the Philistine king, uh, along with his general, Phicol, and now this chap, Ahuzath, his advisor, some kind of king's council here, they come to him, but, but no army, they come in peace. And actually, if you've been with us in our Genesis series, this is, this is again, this is eerily familiar. One presumes these are actually exactly the same gentlemen who many years ago, when, when Isaac was a toddler, actually, back in chapter 22, had stood before his father, and get this, on exactly the same spot, right here at Beersheba. Beersheba's named for this meeting, right? The previous meeting. Same reason, same place, same people. A couple of extra new people there, but same people. Isaac knows why they've come. They want a deal. But Isaac steps up now. Now, now the time and the place are right. He's not just going to roll over. This is the right forum in which to speak his mind and to, and, to, and to demand justice. This is the right time. We're called to be peacemakers as God's people. And our, our expectation, actually, as followers of Jesus is that we will take up a cross daily to follow him. But that doesn't mean being a doormat, you see. And the Apostle Paul is a prime example of this, very instructive to us, especially in the book of Acts, when you look at how he behaves. Because we've already seen, basically, Paul's line uh, in Romans 12 on handling conflict. Don't take revenge, entrust yourself to God, right? But though Paul himself often takes a beating for the sake of the gospel, he also knows when to stand his ground. And there is a time for this. Now, we can't go into all the ins and outs of this. It's quite nuanced, and, and it, you need to think it through carefully. But here are the principles. Maybe you recall the incident that you get in Acts chapter 16. Great story, isn't it? It's Paul and Silas in prison. Do you remember? And they sing, and there's the earthquake, and there's all of this stuff. But in chapter 16, they're in Philippi, Paul and Silas, and they've received a beating, and they've spent a night in, in prison, all because... They cared for and ministered to a girl who was under the, the bondage to demons. They've loved someone and cared for them, preached the gospel. And the next day, after having been beaten and having been put in prison by the, the, the people who lead the city, these same city magistrates want to just send them on their way. But Paul refuses. Sits in the prison. I'm not coming out. Have a look at what, what, what happens here. Uh, Acts 16, 37. Paul said to the officers, they beat us publicly without a trial, even though we are Roman citizens. Now, that's the phrase that puts fear into the people that they're, that they're talking to. They threw us into prison. Now they want to get rid of us quietly? No, no, no. Let them come and let them escort us out of the prison. And the magistrates panic at this when they get word of this. You know, uh, it, 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 these are, are, are Romans, right? These are Roman citizens. If word gets out about this, I mean, that's our jobs. That's, that's us done, if not worse. And so they panic and they meet their demands and they escort them out of the prison publicly in front of everyone in the city, full view. Now, why has Paul done this? Well, it's not to get revenge. That's not why he's done it. It's not because he's been sitting there bitter through the night. Uh, and it's not to put them in their place either, just to feel a bit more empowered and, and bigger. And it's not to justify himself. That's not his primary concern. Why does he do it? It's for the sake of the kingdom of God that he does it. Paul does this so that the reputation of Christ 
and so that re the reputation of his people, his church, will be vindicated. That's a good reason for standing up, isn't it? As a result of what Paul does, the Christians in Philippi, this brand new church, are legitimized, right? Accusations that these Christians, they're just troublemakers, uh, they're, just these, they're just a Jewish troublemaking sect. No, that's all squashed by what Paul does. Okay? The bottom line is Paul stands up for the benefit of others. And he does that because that's exactly what his master does. The one who did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Who went to his death like a lamb led to the slaughter. Think of that. Just led there. And endured the shame and the horror of the cross for the joy of serving and saving and redeeming his people. That is how we're to act, isn't it? So there's the principle. Now back to Isaac. And I think it's the same principle here. He's acting on behalf of all those that he's caring for. He's acting on behalf of the kingdom of God. And why have you come, he demands. You've made it very clear that we are enemies. You made that clear when you banished me. Verse 28, they answered, we saw clearly the Lord is with you. So we said, there ought to be a sworn agreement between us, between us and you. Let us make a treaty with you that you will do us no harm, just as we did not molest you, but always treated you well and sent you on your way in peace. And now... You're blessed by God. It's a very interesting uh, twist on the truth, isn't it? I, I mean, look at it. Look at that last phrase. Uh, are they, I haven't really scrutinized the language here, but are they even insinuating in that last clause that Isaac is experiencing blessing as a result of them sending away, look what a favor we did you, rather than in spite of? Now, no doubt, Abimelech will claim, just like he's got a history of doing, he had no idea about the stealing of these wells. I had no idea it was going on. These recent conflicts with the herdsmen. It's a pretty brazen move, isn't it? Especially when they're standing on the very spot that the treaty was made that they themselves have broken. The very name of the place, Beersheba, if you remember, testifies against them. It, it means the well of oaths and the well of seven because it's there to, cite, to make the oath that Abraham gave seven lambs to Abimelech. And even if Abimelech is trying to save face, though, in, in the light of blatant unfaithfulness, it is a treaty that is needed here. This treaty needs to be in place. And here is the king cap in hand, acknowledging that the Lord is with Isaac, that he has the blessing of his God, and is now requesting, get this, that, they will not, that he will not hurt, harm them. It's amazing. And we mustn't miss how remarkable this is. The tensions between Isaac and the kingdom of the Philistines could just as easily, if not more easily, have, have escalated. Except that God was at work not just in blessing Isaac and prospering him, but even in moving the hearts of his enemies. The book of Proverbs informs us of this, doesn't it? Proverbs 21.1, the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. He directs it like a watercourse wherever he pleases. He's the God of hearts. If Isaac, you see, goes through life, thinking he lives it's just in an unjust world where there's no recourse, there's, there's no power in the hands of those, uh, in all the powers in the hands of those who spitefully use him and he's got no, nothing he can do about it. It's very difficult for him to forgive. But when he realizes that his God is able to control the heart even of pagan kings, then, then he's enabled there, do you see, to be able to treat him gently. And that the tone completely changes, doesn't it? And what is true of Abimelech, the king of the Philistines thousands of years ago, is equally true of the Putins, Zelenskys, and Netanyahus of our world, isn't it? Isn't that why we should pray that the Lord, the Lord of hearts moves hearts for peace? And so even though Isaac's first words to Abimelech, they're harsh, when he realizes that the Lord has moved the heart of this pagan ruler to come to him basically on bended knee, begging for a deal, he realizes once more, my God is in control. 
He holds the heart of the king in his hand. And he turns it whichever way he wants. And knowing this, he's able to show love and forgiveness towards an unjust world. That's how it ends. Isaac, verse 30, then made a feast for them, and they ate and drank. And early the next morning, the men swore an oath to each other, and Isaac sent them on their way, and they left in peace. And that day, Isaac's servants came and told him about the well they dug. They said, we found water, and he called it Sheba. And to this day, the name of the town has been Beersheba. So they finish up with a feast. I mean, that, that's a sign of, of friendship together in this culture, of relationship restored. That's how you sign and seal it. You sit down and you eat together. Isaac is blessed by God, but of course, not everything in the garden is rosy, and, and we'll have to wait to see you know, just, just what is going on in their lives uh, and in their homes next time. But let's draw this chapter together and, and just close it up as it sums up the life of Isaac here. Just in brief, really, here. Those who turn away from God's word in disobedience should not expect his blessing. Isn't that clear? Those who do not put their trust in him will live their lives in constant peril, in constant fear, fear of judgment. That is true for the individual. That is true for the nation. How urgently our world needs to hear this. To be right with their God. Isaac is blessed because he is a man who has chosen to follow in the faith of his father Abraham. Resolving to trust and to obey his God. Now his life has not been without its flaws. It's not been without its struggles. But he has learned the most important lesson of all. There's blessing to be found in obedience and in, in trusting in taking refuge in God, in running to him, rather than in fighting for our own rights. For as the psalmist says, God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Trust him. Let's, let's pray. Father, we, we would seek that refuge in your son, for he is mighty to save He's the king that you've installed on your throne. He's the king that rules forever. And may we be ever aware of the debt that our Redeemer has paid on our behalf as we hold out forgiveness to one another. May we trust in your justice so that we might live peaceful lives, loving our enemies, praying for those who persecute us. Father, this is hard. Help us to grow in this as we fix our eyes on him. And may our hearts constantly then brim over with thanksgiving as we daily bring our requests to you in the name of your beloved Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ.